What's up, my friends? What's up, my foes? So today we are with Captain John Fawkes. So he is another evidence-based guy in the industry. He's got quite a similar background to us. Um, he's come, He's been around the houses with all the the different rolling fads that go on over the years that if it fits your macros and low carb and high carb, all, all this kind of stuff, paleo, fasting. And <coughs> if you've heard our podcast a few weeks ago about the mistakes that we've made, we go into a decade of horrendous mistakes, which I'm sure John has, uh, has been through as well. John, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me, Yusuf. So could you give us a quick background as to who you are for anyone who doesn't know? Yeah, so I um, I have not always been a fitness guy. So I was horribly underweight as a kid. Uh, you know, finally started to kind of get into shape in college after I tried out for a martial arts group at my university and got rejected because they thought I was going to have a heart attack. I was that out of shape. So I finally started hitting the gym and came back next year and got let into it. <laughs> Uh, they said I was the only person who ever came back for a second round after the, after getting turned away. So they, they really liked that. So um, like, um, a unique uh, rejection reason to be like, we think you might die, so probably should. Yeah, die. yeah. Usually when they turn people down, it's we think you're a dick. I think I'm probably the only person who got turned down for, for health reasons. <laughs> so so I, I got let back into that. After school, I worked in a few sales jobs that I that paid really well, but I really didn't like. My last real job was being um, a sales director for an advertising agency, absolutely hated it. So I started this fitness blog kind of as a side business while I was there. And once people started asking me to coach them, I quit that job, just dropped it like a hot stone and never looked back. Nice and so I've been, been doing online fitness coaching for – a little over three years now, uh, blogging for four years. Um, and it's great because I can live wherever I want, uh, spent a year traveling back in 2016 and I get to do what I love, which is read a lot of science stuff and help people get into shape and really feel better about themselves and their ability to accomplish their goals. That's fantastic, man. Yeah. Very similar background as well that, uh, <clears throat> that Johnny and myself are working in finance, hated the job realized mm -hmm. that you know, set up prepping is kind of a passion project just as a sounding board to um, mm -hmm. get the thoughts down and yeah similar similar um thing although we haven't been as exciting as uh, as going and going and traveling for for a year and just working abroad i think there's no reason why not so uh, i see you went to thailand as well i'm guessing did you stay there as part of your travels yeah that was the first place i went uh spent three months in uh Split between Phuket, Koh Phangan, and Bangkok. Love Thailand. Got to go back because I didn't even see the north of the country. Didn't see Chiang Mai. Didn't you? So I've, I've just come back from a month in Chiang Mai. And uh, yeah, really beautiful. Definitely. I hear great things about that, that elephant sanctuary there. Yeah, there's, there's a few. There's some legit ones and there's some that uh, basically rent the elephants and it's a bit it's a bit more oh. than dagger. So I think... Uh, Got to find the right one. Yeah. Exactly. Excellent. Well, man, um, we've got some really interesting topics to cover today. Um, and I'm, so the, the things that we're going to go through are hacking your body's inflammatory cycle for greater gains, how John uses self-experimentation to optimize his life and his performance, and <clears throat> ways to improve sex drive and sexual performance as well. So there's going to be a lot of dick chat. But before we go on, John, would you rather be able <laughs> to see 30 minutes into the future or change what happened five minutes in the past? Mm. See 30 minutes into the future. I mean, the, you wouldn't need to see into the, you wouldn't need to change the past if you could see the future, I suppose, right? Oh God, yeah, you could get yourself into one of these recursive loops, couldn't you? Um, oh yeah. What, what if you had one person who had each power and they just kept canceling each other out? <laughs> That, yeah, they, they'd have a, yeah, do not keep them in the same room or they will, they will have an awful time together. It's, I mean, seeing 30 minutes into the future is just printing money, isn't it? So yeah, just sit, yeah. On, sit on the stock market, do your dirty business and it's it probably mm -hmm. get boring after a while though. Uh, I mean, that's when you switched over to spending that money, I guess. True. <laughs> so would you rather be a hundred percent celibate for the rest of your life? 
the other thing. The other thing. <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna say, but the other thing. <laughs> Fine. Uh, well, we'll we'll cover that towards the end as well. And, uh, <laughs> well. Would you rather live a sad reality or a happy illusion? Ooh, man, that's a tough one. Sad reality, happy illusion. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with sad reality. I don't know. That feels like. That's a very tough one. I feel like... Mm. See, I'm a happy illusion man. I think just because there's no guarantee that we're not all brains in the jar anyway, so why not just change the virtual reality a bit? Like, maybe I'm actually... Maybe that's what we are already, so... Maybe. Mm. I don't know. I just want to know the truth, man. You're a, yeah, you are a truth seeker, and um, looking at your content as well, that's certainly the case. So, speaking of which, <laughs> what what do you want to tackle first? I mean, I, I guess on the the note of truth seeking, and I suppose this feeds into the other two as well, is this approach of self experimentation that you have. Um, yeah, definitely. I think there's so much that um, there's so much of a not only inaccuracy, but at, at the very best, there's a delay between the data that comes out and that filtering into recommendations that we can take for mm. fat loss, for muscle gain, physique enhancement, cognitive enhancement, all those things, mm. um, between the actual results of the studies coming out and what we can do. And very often we find 10 years later, 15 years later, that all of the data on a certain subject has been bunk because it's been funded by um, a not too um, objective party or you know, there's some toxicity or whatever it is. And so self-experimentation is really the direct path to finding out mm -hmm. what it is that you should be doing um, yeah. and what works directly for you without having to wait for data to come out. So I think the fact that you've taken this so seriously is really interesting. Yeah, self-experimentation is great. Yeah, I mean, I first, I think it's probably from reading Tim Ferriss that I really got into this concept. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people in that kind of body hacking space. Tim Ferriss, Dave Asprey, uh, a guy named Natty Liason writes a lot of good stuff about self-experimentation. Um, but there are a few things that, that I think a lot of self-experimenters don't quite get about self-experimentation. Um, you know, I mean, one thing, people have a general idea that you need to kind of control for other variables just like you would in a scientific experiment. But you really are never going to do that as well as an actual like laboratory experiment with multiple subjects would. And so that has a few implications for self-experiments. One is you need to do a lot of repeated bouts and more than most people think. So, uh, you know, a lot of self-experimenters think, you know, I can have, you know, three or four different experimental conditions and I'll try each of them five times. Mm -hmm. And that's really not enough. It's more like 10 or 20. Um, I think that's a really just good because you're not controlling for so many other variables. Totally. Um, I think there's, there's thousands going on at any one time, isn't there? That I think people, yeah. get, people think like, Oh, well there's only two. I either meditated today or I didn't meditate. So what's the problem? It's yeah. Like, there's, if you were to drill down on it, there's probably so many more things with so much more statistical power that are happening mm -hmm. in with variance throughout the day. Um, yeah. And I think it's such a good point that you need so many data points to be able to even draw any, meaningful conclusion yeah. from stuff unless the effect of what you're doing is so strong that it kind of uh, that it overpowers that um yeah I... that's the next thing i was gonna say is uh, you mentioned effect size and statistical power is self-experiments are are only really good for detecting large effects um because you know in spite of everything you might do to enhance their statistical power by by doing more bouts by controlling for variables um, if you find something that makes about a 5% difference, it's probably just kind of a, an illusion, a spurious correlation. So if you read a lot of kind of these self-hacking, self-experimentation blogs, people come up with these conclusions that, you know, my testosterone is 10% higher when I eat high protein or, you know, I, I have like 5% more energy when I cut out juice with breakfast and it's total BS, just, just an illusion, you know? So it's, it's really, and this is both a plus and a minus because it limits what you can do with self-experimentation, 
but it limits what you can do to the most productive things. So you really, you not, you not only should not, but really cannot get down in the weeds of trying to make really small tweaks to your life. Uh, the, the real purpose of self-experimentation needs to be finding the, the really big changes you can make because that's really all it can do. I quite like that. So, you, yeah, you, you, it forces you to look for the big hitters and not for mm -hmm. the really incremental stuff that's not worth obsessing about anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And so by make it by, I guess, by the nature of it, if it has, you have to end up getting the highest yield stuff, then, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's such a common problem that um, that I'm sure you see with clients, which is like, people worrying about <clears throat> how many grams of beta alanine to take post workout or like the really mm -hmm. inconsequential stuff when they're not hitting their average yeah. of calories or they're not training four times a week or something. And it's like, guys, you're wasting your money. You're wasting your time. Focus on the big stuff. And then yeah. you can start playing with the little things. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the self experimentation bloggers really would just benefit from eating a little healthier, getting to bed a little earlier, and working out a little more before they get, get down in the weeds of this stuff, wouldn't they? Definitely. Um, and I, I appreciate their efforts, for sure, because a lot of the stuff I see people do, I'm like, I have not got the patience to be doing this, although it would be great mm -hmm. to know. And, like, there's a guy called, um, well, he's anonymous, but he, he, his website's gwern.com. I don't know if you've seen him. Oh, yeah, so, I've seen that. Okay, so he, I mean, he's a hardcore self-experimental or just he, so he for anyone that doesn't know go to gwern i think it's gwern.net g w e r n and he's a moderator on wikipedia he's a pretty tapped guy like bloody hell he's written some essays on different things but he managed to perform a randomized double blind trial on himself by by blinding mm -hmm. himself in the process seeing whether microdosing lsd improved his mood and he did it i think he ran it for like a year um, always taking a sip of, of one of two bottles of water. One of them had LSD in it, one of them didn't. And ran mm -hmm. a bunch of statistical tests on it. And it's like, man, I'm glad you've got the time to do this stuff. Cause, uh, <laughs> but I, I think he didn't find much of a, much of a difference. I didn't read that one. That one's really interesting. I read, I want to say this was from him, something about intranasal insulin. I want to say that was from him. <laughs> Probably. So you get you get insulin, put it in a spray bottle, and you squirt it up your nose, and somehow it doesn't kill you, even though you're squirting like you know twenty times as much as uh, people would inject because it's just absorbed differently. I and I actually tried it, and I found it insulin really didn't do anything for me. Doesn't kill me. Intranasal insulin. Yeah, doesn't kill me. Doesn't make me really much smarter or anything. So. Damn. Okay. Well. Again, the balls for doing that. I remember reading yeah. about um, a guy who he was. So he had uh, he was taking insulin and growth hormone peptides, mm -hmm. and he injected he 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 misdosed the peptides to a factor of a hundred by accident. So he injected <laughs> like mil, mil, millimeter uh, milliliters rather than nanoliters or some, something like oh, something like that anyway, and. He just, luckily, it was the GHRP and not the insulin. He said he just became ravenously hungry instantly and just ran around the house looking for food. Um, oh, yeah, similarly, I know someone that did that with insulin and then ran into the nearest pick and mix shop and just started eating loads of food, loads of the sweets um, without paying for anything and then uh, and ran out just to bring his blood sugar up. <laughs> the the other thing that reminded me of what you said was um, he, had a, he had one of these subcutaneous needles and he was kidding around just trying to squirt it into his mouth and the needle itself came off and landed on the back of his tongue and he was like don't swallow don't swallow and had to pick it out with some tweezers but i just think the prospect of swallowing a needle would be awful that would be very bad yeah that that would be i mean you'd, you'd live if you get to the hospital but that would be very bad yeah um be pretty awful i mean of course if the, the needle was full of a killer dose of insulin then maybe you'd die yeah. Um, yeah, wow. That, um, I don't even know how you dose it a hundred times too high. Cause a bottle of this stuff probably doesn't even have a hundred. Was he buying like wholesale quantities was, from seeing it was on a forum and from seeing the guy, I was like, this guy's yeah. Experimental at least, but, um, <laughs> Dave looked, looked, he left humanity behind, huh? Yeah. I think so. From seeing the way he was. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah.
Um, so yeah, sorry. So we were, we were saying you were saying that um, it has to be enough of a high yield intervention yeah. to to be worth your time and also to get a result from, and that it's quite a nice natural uh, selector of interventions that you can choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, you, you just need to identify the areas in your life where you have the most room to kind of, you know, make a big improvement. Um, so, you know, just think like, you know, what are your biggest problems right now? What could you improve on the most? For me, that's often been my energy level. I just feel like, you know, sometimes I need an afternoon nap or I feel tired in the morning. So I think, how can I bring up my energy level? How can I sleep better? So one of the best tests that I think anyone can do is the breakfast test where you just experiment with a few different breakfasts, try eating different things for breakfast, try eating, you know, the standard bad American breakfast of cereal and milk, juice and toast and crap. Try eating the standard better American breakfast of bacon and eggs. Try eating, uh, you know, uh, nothing for breakfast, just fasting and waiting try, you know, vegan, uh, you know, different things. And I found personally that the best breakfast for me was either just fasting altogether or going a very high protein, low carb. And I think most people are going to be that way. Some people, a very few people will do better on a high carb breakfast. Uh, I think most people are going to be better on low carb, but it's something to try for yourself. Yeah. And the reason I say most people will be better on low carb is because I mean, carb tolerance is part of it. Like my carb tolerance is actually pretty good though. So I do, I do pretty well on higher carb meals later in the day. But the other factor here is neurotransmitters, which is when you eat more protein, you know, that gives your brain the materials to produce more dopamine. Whereas eating more carbs gives your brain the materials to produce more serotonin, which some of which will then be converted to melatonin. So independent of your carb tolerance, it is generally better to to put more of your carbs later in the day for that reason yeah and i suppose as you said as well like just because some people can tolerate it doesn't mean that it's the best thing to do and yeah the, the, the standard american breakfast of like lucky charms with marshmallows with <laughs> with cereal yeah and orange juice and all that like could I, I mean i went to new york a few years ago and oh, the breakfast yeah. was i asked for pancakes and they gave me 10 thick pancakes with two um but two little cups of syrup and like i'm sure for an american that's like oh well that's the standard breakfast i was like bloody hell there's like 250 grams of carbs <clears throat> straight first thing in the morning like i don't know many people that could handle that without some kind of adverse effect <laughs> so yeah um, yeah well that was just new york man try going to uh you know like iowa or mississippi or something uh you haven't you haven't seen nothing yet man that's just new york <laughs> It's one of the healthier parts of America. Yeah, I, it, it's funny actually. Everyone was like was uber healthy there, but in my impression, America <laughs> yeah. was uh, was the opposite. But I guess you get the extremes, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I yeah, I personally found high protein, low carb earlier in the day tends to be good for me. Except that if I take it too far, because I have tried. I went through a period where I was doing intermittent fasting, skipping breakfast every day, and then having a high protein, no carb lunch and not even having carbs at all until late afternoon after my workout. And what I found was that I would get super tired every afternoon. And it took me a very long time to figure out why. And then when I finally tried the ketogenic diet, it finally clicked that I was going into ketosis every afternoon. Because uh, right. I was I was just going too long without carbs every, so, so if you have a reasonably high carb tolerance, going 16 hours with no carbs at all might cause you to get the keto flu. So so there's the low carb thing can be pushed too hard. I would say too so, far. So that's so something you're, to be you're sort of teetering into that every day and you're having that effect. What what yeah. I like as well, and um, I wonder whether you apply this to to all of your self experiments is that you're picking a outcome that is the actual effect that you're wanting as opposed to <laughs> saying, how can I, um, how can I have a breakfast that minimizes my salivary cortisol or how can I have a breakfast that maximizes my blood glucose management? It's more like I want to feel yeah. more energy. Like that, that's the ultimate thing that I want to get after. 
And I think a really common thing that we get is people saying, I want to increase my testosterone. And you're like, do you want to increase testosterone specifically? Or do you want to be leaner with more muscle mass and better sex drive? Because mm -hmm. they're not always going to be the same thing. Yeah. And testosterone is kind of a good proxy for all those things combined. But, you know, you also have to consider when you're, your outcome is something like that, like how often can you measure, you know, can you take a blood test? Mm. Like, can you measure testosterone 20 times for this experiment? And is that not going to cost you a bunch of money? So, I mean, the, the advantage, the, there's a twofold advantage here. One is I'm measuring what I care about. The other is I'm measuring something that costs nothing to measure. So, and I mean, there are devices coming out that will let you measure uh, testosterone and cortisol and stuff like that at home. Like there's one called Q that I have, that I pre-ordered and then it's years late oh, and then they canceled all the, and then they canceled all the pre-orders and gave me my money back because it's still going to come out where they're probably going to raise the price. So they kind of screwed us on that. Just kind of held our money for years and gave it. Yeah. So I'm still looking forward to that, but I'm also kind of pissed that it's four years late and they're like, Oh, here's your money back. We're, we're probably going to raise the price. Just make it. I, I don't know how many sales they made, but if they made like a few million uh, yeah. of revenue, then, you know, sticking that into a high interest account and then being like, oh, sorry, guys, here's your low. Interest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I don't think they actually did that because I think they, they probably spent it like they have staff. But I think in the end, they got another infusion of venture capital or something. And they were like, well, we don't actually need your pre-order money anymore. Oh, damn. Because that yeah, kind of ticked me off. Because there was that scam of the, the wristband that's meant to act like my fitness pal. I don't know if you've seen that, where it, it claimed to detect the levels of amino acids and glucose and everything in your yeah. blood and, and figure out what your macros have been, or what your intake has been for the day. But it turned out to be bollocks. Um, oh, it was going to it was gonna measure all the different amino acid levels in your blood? Well, to, to try oh, and measure like, what your intake was for that day and give you an accurate, like, you've eaten this many macros, but um, yeah. Turned out to... Yeah, I have no idea how a wristband would even begin to do that. I know. <laughs> like a fucking lasers, quantum physics. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know how they could convince people that. Yeah. Oh, and there was that... a scanner as well for food, where you just, you just take the, the food and you just like, you do that, and then it's like, oh yeah, there we go. It's got the calorie information in it now. So it's like a Star Trek tricorder, basically. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's great. Exactly. Yeah, that would be great if that existed. Um, check back in 30 years, maybe. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Iced. Um, so you were saying See. that um, you'll measure these these are kind of outcomes. If you're running a yeah. test on yourself, are there a series of things that you would always um, always measure or that are kind of the, the lowest hanging fruit when you're, when you're starting and ending an experiment? And if it's any kind of a self-experiment, I usually it would measure energy level. Um, that's a pretty good proxy for just overall health, um, blood sugar management, just a lot of things. Um, cause almost anything that you're, that you're trying to affect, whether it's your blood sugar, testosterone, cortisol, it's all kind of going to impact your energy level. Same with mood. I, I usually measure my mood for the same reason, both because I care about it directly and because it is going to be one of the first things impacted by whatever you do. Um, and sometimes I'll measure libido too, although that's a little more variable and more prone to time of day effects, I would say. Um, but I suppose but again, other if, than, it's, if it's libido, if libido is affected so much yeah. that it's measurably different, then mm -hmm. the, the intervention is worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, other than that, it's really going to depend on what I'm measuring and what the experiment is. Um, so I use self-experiments for a lot of things, not just for health stuff. I use them for social stuff, like I've experimented with how I introduce myself uh, to people, nice. see what reaction that gets. Like I've found calling yourself a blogger really does not impress people. Um, you know, calling yourself a personal trainer a little better, except that, you know, most personal trainers really, it's a shit job. You work at a gym. So, I mean, most people don't understand that being an independent trainer is like way better than working at a gym. Uh, saying I run an online fitness business, better reaction than any of that, you know? So, so you can actually split test even introductions and everything that comes along. Yeah. 
and I think the, one of the other problems, at least at least that we have, is because we don't we don't tend to work as in person personal trainers, um, mm-hmm. and so it. But it's the easiest thing to say. Like when someone asks you what what do you do, you're like, oh, you know what? Yeah. It's just for the sake of simplicity. Like, but that's usually if it's someone who I, I don't really want to be talking to, and I'm just like, look, I'll yeah. just give them a I'll just give them an answer rather than like open up this bunch of questions that you're not really prepared to yeah to get into. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I hate I hate where that leads because they're like, oh, like the guys at Twenty Four Hour Fitness. No, not like them. <laughs> Nothing like them. Yeah. Don't ever mention Twenty Four Hour Fitness. <laughs> Do not compare me to them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's see another one I really like. Um, and this is one that's not very well known is you can do a self experiment to test the style of training that will work best for you. And this is actually one that um, I didn't come up with. This came out of an actual academic experiment. Um, and I can't remember the exact name of the study, like effect of different training styles on rugby players or something, but it was a, uh, it's by a professor in New Zealand named Martin Beaven. And what he did was he got this college rugby team and he tested and he had them try four different workouts, a strength style workout where they do, you know, sets of five at 85% of their one rep max bodybuilding style workout where they do sets of like 10 or 12, a uh, high rep workout where they do sets of 20 or so and a power workout where they do sets of like five, but at very low weight and high velocity. And what he did was he had each of the rugby players try each of these workouts and he would measure their testosterone and cortisol afterwards because the testosterone to cortisol ratio is the best marker we have of how well you've recovered from a workout. And so then for each individual player, he, um, he identified which, uh, training style produced their best T to C ratio and which produced their worst T to C ratio. And so he put half of them on their best program and half of them on their worst program for three weeks. And then after three weeks, he flipped that around. And so the first half were on their worst program. The second half were on their best program. So it was all for each of these 18 or so players. It was individualized based on their individual response. And what he found was that, you know, every single one of them, gained strength and gained muscle mass like at a pretty good pace for people who are already very advanced on their best protocol and then but once each of them were put on their worst protocol the one that gave them their worst t to c ratio most of them lost strength and mass a few of them gained just a little bit most of them lost and so he found that yeah three weeks each so it was three weeks on one and then like a two week break and then three weeks on the other that was a really so good study. yeah the, probably the most underappreciated study ever in the history of sports science so you know again when this q thing comes out you can do this literally the way they did it but for now you can't really measure testosterone and cortisol the way you need to because you really would need to measure them like within an hour after the workout uh, and a bunch of times. So what you would really probably want to do is just go off the way you feel, like measure your energy level, mood, libido every hour or two post workout. And then the next morning and see which one you feel the best after doing. So the workout workout that makes you feel like shit after, you know, if you, if you're a bro science kind of guy, you probably think that's a good thing. Like, Oh man, this workout really beat the shit out of me. That's yeah. great. And that turns out that's not true based on this study, believe it or not, then the no pain, no gain thing is a little bit overstate. It's true. Like you need to feel fatigued while you're working out, but it's not true that you should feel like shit afterwards. It turns out based on this study, the workout that that's going to give you the best results is generally actually the one that you recover fastest from. So, and that's because we know now, I mean, it's, pretty well established at this point that the main thing that drives muscle growth is total training volume. So the workout you recover fastest from and best from is going to be the one de facto that allows you to tolerate the highest volume. Yeah, Um, so it it kind of makes sense that that's like the the door that permits you to accumulate the most volume. Yeah, so what you can do is you can try these four different uh, training styles. And again, because you can't, 
uh, directly measure testosterone and cortisol the way they did, I would experiment with each of them multiple times rather than just once like they did in the study. Um, and then once you identify your best and worst training styles, just stick to the best style for the most part, barring a little bit of daily undulating periodization. So I found that my best style was probably strength, although power was a close second. But then higher rep training styles really just beat the crap out of me and don't do are not as good for me. Um, and based on DNA testing, I mean that that also backs that up. If you look at your, I want to say it's the ACE genotype that's been associated with your response to high versus low rep training. And I have the the kind of high weight low rep gene. So I I mostly train at the in the five rep range. Um, usually with heavy weights, occasionally I'll really lower the weight and do five or six reps power style. And then I'll mix in a little bit of like stuff in the eight to 12 rep range, just as part of a, for variety, you know, daily undulating periodization and all that. But it's not like for the core most... part of your yeah. training, I suppose. Yeah. It's similar but, to but, um, Christian Thibodeau, where he's like, you know, the, the workouts that uh, activate me the most are the ones that I do more and the uh the ones that drain me i don't make the progress on and like um i guess like the 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 macho dogmatism in the industry is that you yeah as you said you have to beat yourself up every time whereas actually yeah if you can do the things which um you come away having done the most volume with and not not dragging yourself out of the gym and that allows you to train more then it's a win-win for everyone so when yeah. when you're testing something like this, will you attempt to at least hold the other variables constant? So like when you you'll try and train in the same time every day, um, mm -hmm. same sort same thing pre workout, same kind of circumstances like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I really make an effort to hold everything else constant, and I train at the same time every day. I mean, roughly barring you know perturbations in my daily schedule, but it's just you should train at the same time every day just for the sake of building a routine and building habits regardless of this experimentation stuff. I mean, it's just you want to build a, you know, a regular routine anyway. And your body will become entrained to the time of day you normally train. So it'll, you'll start to have more energy as training time approaches if you train at the same time every day. Like if anyone's so not there's, done morning training yeah. and then you start and you're like, oh, yeah. God, this is so horrible. But then like after a week, it's actually <laughs> totally fine. Oh God. Yeah. I used to do morning training. Now I'm, now I'm strictly a late afternoon, early evening guy. Love it so much better. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't do all the pre-workout caffeine anymore, but that's good because I, I have actually, I'm on a caffeine washout now. I'm about a week into it and I feel amazing. Nice. First two days sucked. Third day was okay. Ever since then I've been great. So we, you know, we just posted about that today, actually about doing the caffeine washout and how yeah. people, They'll be like, oh, no, I'm, I'm not addicted. I just really like heroin. And it's like, that's the words of an addict. Like, we need to take yeah. some time to fully reset. And then at least you can get yeah. the the ergogenic benefits from caffeine, the performance-enhancing ones, without having to take so much that you're disrupting your sleep and that you're causing yeah. all the side effects. Yeah. Be beyond a certain point, the main <laughs> benefit of caffeine is that it alleviates caffeine withdrawal symptoms. I mean, that's <laughs> once you're addicted, that's all it's doing. That's a, so, and, that's a terrible and, benefit to chase, yeah. isn't it? So. Yeah, and the, the most popular blog or article on my blog is actually about how to kick a caffeine addiction. That's my number one article right now. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's and it's it's pretty easy to kick a caffeine addiction. What you got to do is, I mean, A, just go cold turkey, but also if you take either L-tyrosine or DL-phenylalanine amino acid supplements, you can – really dramatically reduce the withdrawal symptoms because what those two amino acids act as precursors to dopamine in your brain. So a lot of the withdrawal symptoms come from having low dopamine because caffeine has, you know, A, desensitized your receptors and B, low, uh, depleted your kind of stores of those two amino acids. So if you take those morning and early afternoon for the first few days, the withdrawal gets a lot easier. Although for me, the times I've done this in the past, it was very easy because I was only kicking a caffeine addiction. This particular time, it was still hard even with that because I was actually kicking a caffeine, modafinil, ephedra, oh my. nicotine, <laughs> what, uh, DMA, whatever the fuck else I was speedballing. I mean, I just 
I've been going way overboard, uh, theocrine. Like I've just been mixing and matching every stimulant I can find for the past two months or so. So terrifying. It, the, so, the first few, the first two days were still kind of tough. Had to take afternoon naps. Uh, yeah. Third day, all right, but within three days, even with all that, it, within three days, I was fine. Felt better than I felt in months. Today, I feel amazing. So it doesn't take that long, really, to to get no. back up to baseline. How um, how did you find the modafinil? It's not something I've ever tried. Oh, the modafinil. So I. I actually remember I said I was traveling back in 2016. Mm. I I bought it in India. You can just walk into pharmacies there, <laughs> and I, I bought like 150 pills or something. And I don't even take a whole pill at a time. I take like a half a pill if I really want to get going. Otherwise, I take a quarter of a pill. So I honestly bought a several years supply so during my busted month. pills. Then yeah. Well, I mean the pills are 200 milligrams, which is the standard dose. It's just that. Modafinil has a very long half-life, like 12 or 15 hours, so it'll just fuck your sleep. So what I do actually is I never just do modafinil. I, um, I will take a much smaller dose of modafinil combined with caffeine because they have a synergistic effect, but the caffeine has a much shorter half-life. So I'll take modafinil plus caffeine right when I wake up and then a little more caffeine up until like early afternoon and then cut that out. And so that doesn't ruin my sleep nearly as much because I'm not leaning as heavily on a long half-life drug. And how, yeah. how does it compare subjectively to caffeine? Uh, modafinil is it's not as physically stimulating as caffeine. So it doesn't really raise my body temperature. It doesn't get my heart rate up. It doesn't really have no much use. As or pre, yeah, no shakes. It's not useful as a pre-workout. It is very strictly mental, very little physical stimulation on its own. Now, combined with caffeine, the physical stimulation is a little greater than caffeine alone. So there's a synergistic effect, but on its own, very little physical stimulus, just kind of awake, you know, not, and not jittery, just awake. Um, and nicotine is similar. Nicotine is, because I use nicotine patches sometimes, and it makes you very awake, very focused. There's very little physical stimulation. Um, the one thing I have found about nicotine, though, is the hyper focus that it gives you kills your creativity, or at least for me, and I've heard this from other people too. It's just like you almost end up with a one track mind to where you're good at doing non creative work, but like <clears throat> I'm trying to write articles on nicotine, I just get the worst writer's block. Like so I just to like sit somewhere I get down one, in front of a spreadsheet. Yeah. And you say, right, there's nicotine patches, off you go. But coming to writing and so, because yeah. nicotine is one of those things that it looks, it looks really appealing to me, apart from the obvious yeah. downsides. Do you think, have you found with the patches that do you get any of the withdrawal or the, the addictive side effects with it? Nicotine is really not addictive. No, I mean, it, cigarettes are addictive, but they have a bunch of other stuff in them too, like nicotine patches people really don't seem to get addicted to them. Like it just doesn't seem to be an issue. I mean, and I still don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not taking this anywhere near every day. Um, like I haven't really used it in a week, but before when I was using nicotine, it was maybe three days a week and I was using a very low dose. So the nicotine patches you can buy are like seven, 14 or 21 milligrams. And I would buy, you know, the largest, but then I would like cut it up into like six or whatever. So I'm taking like half of the lowest dose they actually sell for Very people quitting. With, with your drugs. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like they charge the same amount of money for every dosage uh, because it's so it's just like buy the biggest one and start cutting it up, right? With some yeah. scissors. Um, but the one thing I like about nicotine is it has a very short half life of like two hours. So you use the patch, you take it off in the evening. It does have a metabolite called cotinine which has similar effects to nicotine and has a much longer like 14 hour half life, but is also weaker than nicotine. So, so once I learned that, I realized you don't want to keep it, keep the patch on right up until bedtime or an hour, hour before bedtime. You want to take it off, you know, reasonably like three or four hours before bedtime, but still it's something you can keep using into the early evening without, you know, really 
hugely impacting your sleep. Whereas say caffeine, you want to cut out by like noon to really avoid impacting your sleep. And even then studies have shown it, it still has a bit of an effect on reducing deep sleep. Yeah. At, at, at least for me as well. Like I find I, so I, I did a, I've sort of done a two or three year coffee washout. Um, I guess it's not really a washout anymore. It's just going cold Turkey. And then I've, I've reintroduced it a few weeks ago and I'm falling asleep during the day much well yeah I, I didn't used to and now i do and it's like i'm clearly borrowing wakefulness from somewhere um yeah i also didn't expect that from speaking to you i'd be going away and buying some nicotine patches but I'm, i think that's certainly on the cards now I'm just gonna look into it a bit start more start out with a very very low dose because if you take too much you'll you'll get kind of sick and maybe throw up great <laughs> not it's not gonna kill you but it'll make you nauseous fair enough so We've, we've covered a bit of the background on self-experimentation here and the ways to track your variables, the way to track the outputs as well, and some stuff on effect size. Now, you've applied this to inflammation specifically, and this is what I'm mm-hmm. quite interested to dig into. Can you tell us a bit mm-hmm. about that? Yeah, so I want to I wanna preface this by saying this inflammation stuff is pretty new. Uh, it seems to be working for me, but... I, I can't honestly say that I've experimented with it enough to have isolated the variables and be sure that this is the reason I've been making good gains lately. But it seems to be working for me and there's a theoretical basis for it. So having said that, uh, your inflammation goes up after you work out. You know, work, Exercise causes inflammation both in the body as a whole and more so in the, in the muscle group that's been worked. And, you know, there's this common misconception. There are a lot of misconceptions about inflammation, but the biggest one is that it's bad, that inflammation is just bad. And the truth is it exists for a reason. It's not just plain bad. It, um, chronic inflammation, like if you're just inflamed all the time, is bad. You don't want to be inflamed all the time. But acute inflammation that's kind of just a spike of inflammation that's short-lived in response to a stressor is good because it really is part of the recovery process. So I remember reading about kind of inflammation from exercise years and years ago, and someone, I don't remember if it was Charles Poliquin or someone else, had recommended taking like an aspirin either right before or right after your workout. Sounds like a poliquinism, doesn't it? Um, Yeah, to cut down on that inflammation to help your body recover. And And I think I tried it for a while and it didn't really work for me. And what I've learned more recently is that that's because that's dead wrong. It's the exact opposite of what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember once I, a few months ago or sometime last year, I was reading about inflammation on some fitness blog and I was, it finally occurred to me that I didn't really fully understand what inflammation was. So I went over to Wikipedia and looked up the article on inflammation. And of course, one of the first things that it says in the article is, you know, inflammation is characterized by like, by redness, swelling, and increased blood flow. And I was like, oh, oh, shit, increased blood flow. That sounds like something I want in my muscles after I work out. So so you really want your your muscles to be inflamed after they work out. That's part of the healing process, and it's part of the anabolic signaling that tells the body, give more nutrients to this body part. It needs to be fixed up. Well, directly activate some of these growth pathways as well. And so, yeah, yeah, exactly, the... The aspirin thing, um, I'm sure I'm sure you've seen as well that like the the data that's coming out on non steroidal anti inflammatories and training mm-hmm. and the fact that it it's it's counterproductive for for muscle growth after training, but also for people that have got some kind of musculoskeletal injury, taking a mm-hmm. NSAID straight away will slow the the tissue repair process. Yeah, and so yeah, really we've then got to weigh up symptom control with um, tissue repair. And, yeah. uh, you know, even any of the kind of non-pharmaceutical approaches to minimizing inflammation, like having a cold shower immediately post-training has a similar negative sort of dampening effect on hypertrophy mm-hmm. for the same reason. So, yeah, I think whoever, whoever it was that recommended that take an aspirin post-workout is, yeah, that's yeah. A, a poorly informed recommendation. They kind of, yeah, they, they understood that, that exercise causes inflammation, but kind of misunderstood what inflammation does to the body. So, yeah, so, so the, the kind of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are generally bad for your gains, but it depends on timing, right? Because 
you want a short spike of inflammation after you work out. And by short, I mean somewhere on the order of, you know, hours. I mean, somewhere four to 12 hours probably if you're a pretty experienced trainee. If you're a total newbie, it might actually be a more than 24 hour period. So what I've been doing is taking a baby aspirin in the mornings, you know, when I'm when I'm past the period during which I would I would want to have inflammation. So I work out sometime in the afternoon between usually between three and six. Um, so I'll take a, a baby aspirin first thing in the morning, and on a day when I'm not working out, I'll maybe take another one in the late afternoon. So what I'm doing there is I'm lowering my baseline level of inflammation when I'm outside of that acute post-workout inflammatory spike in order to, because really there's a kind of a signal to noise relationship here where you want your overall level of chronic inflammation as low as possible and then you want your spike post-workout to be as high as possible albeit fairly short-lived um and and again the duration of that spike things that we that we that people chase you know um, yeah. cortisol insulin testosterone all of these things like they are about you know we we don't want to stop cortisol all the time we want it to be you know a short mm-hmm. spike while we're training to fuel the training session and actually get us up off our arms yeah. um insulin same thing you know you don't want chronically high insulin because obvious obvious downsides of that um mm-hmm. and so yeah i think yeah. a lot of the problems come from these fitness bloggers that just take a concept and think ah insulin bad or cortisol bad inflammation good, yeah but yeah and it's like yeah and there there's might be some correlation causation error here because of course people who are out of shape tend to have chronically elevated inflammation cortisol insulin but you know that doesn't mean directly reducing all of those things all the time is the way to go uh so another thing i'll do to enhance the inflammatory spike post-workout is i will use um i'll use a uh, short acting stimulants sometimes, although I haven't been using this for the last week or so, but I'll use short acting stimulants pre-workout, both to fuel the workout, to train harder, and to kind of enhance the inflammation. But, you know, they're much shorter lived. So I use something called higanamine, which is a a stimulant, you can get it on Amazon, but it has a half-life of, well, in studies, it has a half-life of around 15 or 20 minutes, although that's when they inject it intravenously. So when you, when you swallow it, it's going to last longer because you have to account for both absorption speed and then elimination speed. But still, higanamine is, you know, it's probably out of your system within two hours as opposed to all day for caffeine. So it's a very good pre-workout, particularly for when you're working out later in the day. And you don't, and when you're working out late enough in the day that caffeine would would upset your sleep, um, and of course those stimulants are going to enhance the inflammatory effect and the and both and raise your cortisol level post workout, but this one won't do it for very long, so it'll kind of it'll help me train harder and kind of put the body into full alert while still you know letting me come back down from that a few hours later. I see. Uh, yeah, another thing I do is I take vitamin C right before bed. Uh, so vitamin C lowers cortisol levels, and of course it helps the body repair tissue also, which you directly aids in the healing process. But it also uh, helps to clear cortisol out of the muscles. And cortisol is actually an anti-inflammatory. So people tend to kind of lump cortisol and inflammation together, and they often kind of do go together, but they're actually the reason they go together is because your body will produce cortisol in response to elevated inflammation to try and control it. And so I will, you know, I will try to, I'll take the vitamin C to lower cortisol, which helps me sleep at night probably, but also will keep the inflammatory spike going a little bit into the night, which is good because, you know, then when you sleep is also when your body is doing the most to repair itself. So I'd like to have the inflammation still going a little bit when I go to sleep. And then by the time I wake up in the morning, I'm, you know, it's been at that point, you know, a good 16 hours since I've trained, 12 to 16 hours. The inflammation spike is probably passed by that point. And of course, cortisol is elevated in the morning anyway, which is going to lower it further. So 
so so late afternoon, early evening training tends to be good timing from that standpoint too, just in terms of uh, sinking the inflammation spike with your your daily natural cortisol rhythm, because cortisol is highest in the morning and lowest in the evening. Um, and so that's good. So then in the morning, I have, I have my aspirin, I have my high cortisol levels, and I'm back to my really low baseline of inflammation. So I've been doing this for a few months now, and I've been, you know, making really solid gains, even and even on stuff where I'd been plateaued for a long time. Right. So hard to say that it's really because of this. I mean, I've also moved to a new city. I mean, I'm really under the circumstances, this is not very well controlled as far as self experiments go, but there is a solid theoretical basis for it, and it's working so far. I uh, mean, it's that's something really interesting. I've never, I've never uh, heard of yeah. someone optimizing inflammation in in that way and kind of taking um, mm -hmm. the day into compartments and and trying to modulate it up and yeah. down based on that. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that yeah. how that works out. Yeah, meditating in the evening to kind of lower cortisol and relax me probably helps too. Oh, um, yeah, compared to but, like, like the, the habit yeah. that most of us have, including me, is like so much screen time before bed and it's usually work yeah. and stressful stuff and then you go to bed and you're just mincing over the stuff and it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, terrible habit. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I mean, that's probably not the main benefit of meditation. The main benefit, lower stress helps me sleep. I mean, obviously if you sleep better, you're gonna recover better and that's probably ultimately more important than any of this inflammation hacking. So, I mean, I will say meditation probably contributes to this inflammation cycling, but it's far from the main reason I meditate. I'm a, I'm a naturally high stress guy, so I just, I have to control that. That's another reason for me to cut caffeine. It's, yeah. if you're a naturally very relaxed person, caffeine's great. If you're a high stress person, you know, cut it back a little bit, a lot, maybe cut it out. Well, yeah, and you know, if if caffeine increases state anxiety in everybody, yeah. then if you've already got a higher baseline, then it's not it's not exactly the the best yeah. thing to do. So, are there any apps or tools or um, anything you'd recommend for tracking this stuff and looking at the variables, or do you tend to put it on a spreadsheet? I usually just use a spreadsheet. I've tried apps, and none of them really. They just take more work than just taking my own notes, and none of them crunch the numbers all that well. Like I've been, I've been for a while. I've been logging my food and supplements and everything on this app called Kara, which is kind of a symptom tracker app. But the problem is, it really only correlates what you've been doing that day with symptoms you've been do getting that day. So it won't. This app, whoever programmed this app, doesn't even seem to think that like what I ate yesterday might affect me today. Like there's nothing in the app that accounts for that. It just, it seems to treat each day as a fresh start. So it, so it's analytics really are not good enough to justify the work of using it. Hmm. That's a shame. Cause it, it, it's like yeah. some of those apps that everything is like 99% there and you're like, Oh, that could be so great. But then they, they neglect yeah. day changes or like, so I use sleep cycle for example, which is an app that, um, uses the accelerometer in your phone to detect your state of, of depth in your sleep. Um, yeah. So you can also use your microphone as well. And, and it gives you a graph at the end of the, the day and you can put in notes based on, you know, had caffeine today, meditated today, mm -hmm. took ZMA, exercised, any of those things. And I, although I've used it and I did get some good correlations, the, prob the really annoying thing about this, and I, I don't know if they're going to fix it, is that they so because they correlate your sleep score as a percentage mm -hmm. with um the and, and with the the note that you put in now the sleep mm -hmm. score is comprised of length of sleep and total percentage time mm -hmm. in deep are in deep REM sleep so it's like that that screws up the data because if you just slept longer for a completely mm -hmm. um you know uh, convenience reason or, or you managed to get a longer sleep that night that would increase your sleep score when technically it's not improved the quality of your sleep it's just improved the length and so mm -hmm. they conflate quality and quantity and it means that it ruins your data in a lot of ways unless you yeah. just like naturally sleep until you woke up every day but even <clears throat> even then yeah you'd like either. to separate them out huh <laughs> yeah so yeah. it's a shame but what it did do at least over a kind of set, a couple of years of data points is show um what you what you'd expect really is that 
ZMA and meditating improve sleep. Mm-hmm. Caffeine reduced the quality slightly. Um, exercising in the evening mm-hmm. wasn't great, and in the morning was was better. But you know, all yeah. of that stuff you can kind of guess that it's going to happen anyway. So it's good to get a confirmation at least. Yeah, and I actually so I created a spreadsheet complete with a like a graph. It spits out a graph based on the data that you put into it. Uh, and I released it on my blog like a year or two ago. Um, wasn't very popular. I think probably too much work for most people, but if anyone wants to try this, it's, uh, Google, Google graphs or something spreadsheet. Uh, and the blog article is called what self experience. So I don't remember the name of the blog we'll article. The John, the show notes for look, look up John Fox self experiments. Yeah. We'll put the link in the show notes. Amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, that would be, it'd be good to play with that spreadsheet for sure. So um, on to the thing that people have been itching to uh, to hear about, which is uh, how you improved your sex drive and sexual performance. Yeah. So I, I have done a lot of experiments with sex drive and sexual performance. Um, you know, and we'll start with the obvious. Um, Eating a higher fat diet and particularly higher saturated fat raises your sex drive. Works for me, works for everyone, because of course that causes your body to produce more cholesterol, which then gets converted into pregnenolone, which is the precursor for steroid hormones. So eating a higher fat diet, very good for sex drive. And surprisingly, eating too much protein is actually bad for your sex drive, lowers your testosterone levels, lowers sex drive. It's been validated in studies anyway. Like in my personal experience, I haven't varied protein all that much or like particularly found an effect from that. Um, I mean, I found that eating way too much protein, I mean, the the studies I'm thinking of are just correlational. So it's just more protein equals less. Like I don't know if they looked at – oh, no, no. There was one that separated people into like quintiles and they found – like the fourth and fifth quintile, meaning if you eat more than the average amount of protein, it was negatively correlated with testosterone. But the amount of protein that you really need is maybe like 0.8 grams per pound of body weight per day if you're an active trainee, which equates to in kilograms, it's 0.8. That's about just under two grams per kilo of body weight per day. That's like 1.7 grams per kilo body weight per day. So, so that's what, like an 80 kilo man is going to be 140, 100, 140 to 160 grams of protein. Yeah. Roughly per day. Yeah. <clears throat> and more than that is good for satiety, but it's not really helpful for muscle growth. And it based on studies is counterproductive for testosterone levels. Um, and it, compare that to, you know, the typical bro bodybuilding myth of, at least one gram per pound of body weight per day, and a lot of people are eating two or three, meaning they're eating like half a kilo of chicken breast per day, you know? Some people um, take the piss with uh, with protein. Yeah, I, I guess it's yeah. just this uh, this idea of like more is better. Yeah, or I should say half a kilo of protein, meaning like three kilos of chicken breast yeah. or whatever that would be. Um, I mean, I remember a, a teach. I remember I took a nutrition class in college and the teacher told me about some bodybuilder in her class who came to her saying, I have really low energy. I feel like shit. I don't know why I eat so healthy. And she says, what do you eat? Well, I eat 16 chicken breasts a day. I should be feeling great. I'm like, no, moron. You can't live off pure protein, you know? It's, but yeah, it's eating on how, like, how blind people get to like, hey, I'm living this really abnormal lifestyle. And yeah. I'm feeling really abnormal. Uh, what's yeah. wrong? And it's like, well... You, you know, look at what you're doing and <laughs> yeah. see that the protein is isn't magic. <laughs> yeah. So, so eating more, eating more fat and particularly saturated fat and also cholesterol helps with sex drive. Um, a few other things that are helpful that both in my personal experience and my self experiments and also have been heavily validated by research. Meditation helps both sex drive and erectile function a lot, like a lot. Okay. And it, um, so for a few reasons, one is lowering anxiety is naturally going to raise sex drive and help with erectile function. 
And it also, I think meditation is going to directly improve testosterone because it'll lower cortisol. And as I mentioned before, testosterone and cortisol are both steroid hormones. They're both made from the same precursor hormone, pregnenolone. So they compete with each other for raw materials. So if you lower the, uh, your body's production of one of those hormones, it's naturally going to raise the other one just by freeing up those raw materials and by switching your body over to that other hormonal pathway because they are really competing pathways. So meditation has been shown in studies to be a very effective treatment for erectile dysfunction and somewhat effective for raising testosterone levels. Uh, direct effects on libido, somewhat mixed results, although in my experience, good. Um, well, I, I suppose I would, as well, like if you're getting more erections um, yeah. when you previously didn't, then that's going to at least predispose you to more sexual activity and the cycle of yeah. more libido as well. Very much creates a cycle, yeah. Um, and then another thing for not so much libido but erectile dif- dysfunction is Kegel exercises where you squeeze your kind of taint muscles. Um, taint. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in, in the UK, we refer to that as the uh, the gooch. Um, the gooch, the, the uh, chode. Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. Um, so can you explain how someone would do a, a Kegel exercise? Yeah, it's basically, so imagine if you're, t- if you're peeing, basically, imagine how you would squeeze your muscles to stop yourself peeing midstream when you're not actually done yet. That's kind of how it goes. So it's, it's, that, it's that muscular contraction. Or how you would just squeeze your muscles to, like, flop your dick up and down if you wanted to do that. Okay. If you were putting on. If you're putting on like a puppet show or something, well, a puppet show, yeah, with hat, hat yeah. on top. So, so I suppose. Yeah, you see those shows, shows, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I usually every day, but um, I think what the the best thing to do is um, progressive overload, usually using a five three one protocol, um, with yeah. progressively heavier hats on the end, um, and I yeah. like to work up to a max by the end of each month, deload, reset the max. And yeah. Then, gradually step it up so that by week um, 10 you just stick your dick in a mouse trap and oh yeah exactly yeah that's now what i actually do is i do actually do sets and reps though 10 sets of 10 reps of kegels uh four to six days a week and the way you progressively overload it is by uh lengthening the contractions so at first it's just like a momentary contraction then you go to like a one or two second hold and gradually work up to like a 10 second hold and then uh, you can start doing a longer hold at the end of each set. So do 10 Kegels, each of which is like a five or 10 second hold. And then at the end of the 10th Kegel, squeeze and hold for 30 seconds, then raise that to 60 seconds. And then once you get to the point where you're doing 10 sets of 10 uh, reps, each of which is like a 10 second contraction with a 60 second contraction at the end of each set, and you're doing that like five or six days a week, uh, you know, you strengthen those muscles as much as you need to. And so this has been validated in, um, in research as being very good for erectile dysfunction, probably apparently because these muscles help to restrict the blood flow out of the penis is, is what it seems to be. So that seems to be part of their function is that they kind of clamp down on that, the veins coming out of the dick area. Um, that's one mechanism. The other mechanism is kind of the, the nitric oxide and whatever, which is what Viagra works on, which exercise won't really help with, but overall fitness will. Like overall cardiovascular fitness will help with that. Um, so that's that's how to get stronger boners. Meditate and do Kegels. And you know those two of those things together will have an almost Cialis-like effect after a couple months of regular practice. Um, there we go. So two another- based recommendations for if you if you get a floppy when you're nervous meditate, yep. do kegels 10 sets of 10 yeah uh, another thing that helps uh interact with new attractive women or partners whoever you're attracted to um just just merely i mean having sex with a new partner will raise your sex drive for a few days but um even just you know, if you can't do that or you're in a monogamous relationship, even just interacting with some attractive girls, flirting with them, that's going to raise your sex drive. So giving yourself sexual stimulus and pornography doesn't really seem to do it. You need to actually interact with people in person. Uh, if pornography did it. I don't think any of us would have this issue, but 
But, you know, if you just go out and like talk to some cute girls, flirt with them, you know, maybe make out with them, maybe hook up with them, but even just flirting will do it. That in itself will raise your sex drive. So, that, so mean, it's exposure that, that to new. From yeah. like an evolutionary perspective as well, wouldn't it? Yeah. That, um, you know, we, we, we had a question from a, a reader a few weeks ago about pornography and testosterone. And it's like, realistically, the, there is no adaptive advantage to sitting in your house with dick in hand. And so yeah. as a result, it's not going to be something that is perpetuated by yeah. the, the body's visceral drives. And whereas interacting with people in, in real life is always going to, um, you know, your body is going to start preparing you more and more for that. Yeah. And pornography doesn't lower testosterone. It just doesn't really raise it either. I, I do want to get this out there because there's this idea floating around that pornography lowers your testosterone levels. And the reason people believe that is because there was one famous study that showed that pornography lowered testosterone levels like 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And the thing most people don't know is dozens of other replication studies have been done on this one and they all found no effect. But most of them didn't even get published. Like it's so – so this this pornography testosterone thing is a, a – one of the prime examples of the replication si crisis in science where you have a really cool finding but – you know, it happened once and no one can seem to replicate it. So then the, the for now, finding yeah. it's really, so a, a similar study that's kind of fallen to that is, um, I don't know if you've seen, there was a Ted talk about it as well, about power poses and how standing oh, yeah. in a certain way improves your TC ratio and all this stuff And it. And yeah, when it's been replicated, they couldn't find anything. Like there were improvements yeah. in subjective mood, which if anything, as, yeah. as you've covered, are, are a better proxy because Ultimately, if you yeah. improve your testosterone cortisol ratio, but there's no change in mood or, or any of the tangible effects from it, then what's yeah. the point? But um, yeah, it, it's one of those things that like it's since it's been replicated, the replications haven't really got much traction. But because it's yeah. quite a sexy sounding study, everyone thinks like, oh, quick hack to, you know, improve yeah. your hormones. Well, and to be fair, I mean, putting on power poses probably will make you feel more confident in the moment. I mean, I think it works from that standpoint. Um and it's something you can very easily experiment with, but albeit, I mean, I guess it's prone to placebo effect, but if so, you're measuring mood, how do you separate actual effect from placebo? Yeah, it, but exactly. It's, but the, so the other thing that, they, that I think they found was um, people's re readiness to believe their own thoughts. And they found that when they're sat in a more kind of power pose, they were more likely to believe their own thoughts, whether they were positive or negative. So they just had more, yeah. more confidence, more credence in their own statements yeah <clears throat> compared to when they said that makes that. sense yeah i mean it, it is true that you can change your mental state by changing your kind of behavior or your um your posture and you'll there will, there will kind of be a feedback between that that uh you know you can change your thoughts by changing the way you move the way you talk the way you act so that's true but the, the effect of power posing on testosterone and cortisol has always been a little bit implausible because testosterone and cortisol are, you know, they have half lives of two or three hours, which is not super long, but it's long enough that it's really unlikely that that ratio would be significantly changed by just a few minutes of power posing. Mm. Like just based on their half lives, you would think you would need an hour or more of power posing to really significantly <laughs> change them. That's a good point. Yeah, you'd be you'd be shaking from the, the, the deep lunge. Of yeah. Hour, so, yeah. Yeah. Now, now, if you just kind of like pull out your schlong and start waving it around at people and being like, I am the alpha male, maybe that'll work better. The ultimate warrior. But that's, and, yeah. yeah. Step into the ring, brother, <laughs> you know? But you really got to go all out, you know? Just putting your hands on your hips, it's not the minimum effective dose. You've got to, you, yeah. you have to whip it out and start screaming at people. <laughs> that's, that's the only way to be alpha enough to just raise your testosterone on command. Very important, to be honest. I think um, we, we yeah. need a few Russian studies to um, yeah. look at that specifically. Yeah. What else is I going to say? Cutting out stimulants is going to help your libido, um, at least after you're over the first few days. Um, and that largely works by the cortisol thing I mentioned because, uh, you know, if you look at studies on stimulants and in particular pre-workout caffeine, um, they find that stimulants can acutely raise testosterone a little bit, but they raise cortisol more. So in the long run, that's going to lower testosterone via that competition pathway. 
uh, but also they desensitize your receptors and in particular your dopamine receptors. So dopamine is involved in sexual desire. And when it comes to sexual desire, dopamine is probably more important than testosterone. Testosterone is more important for sexual function, but dopamine is, I think, a little more important than testosterone from the standpoint of initial sexual desire. So when you cut out stimulants that stimulate the, that agonize the dopamine receptors, and you let those receptors resensitize, which takes about seven to ten days, maybe longer for someone who's been speedballing like I have, but usually like nine or ten days for most people is the longest it takes in research. That's going to resensitize the receptors and kind of bring back your sense of sexual desire a bit more. So on that note, you said you was it phenylalanine and tyrosine were the two things yes. you took to it, to improve the precursors to um, to dopamine. Have you found those yeah. alone have made have any effect on uh, sex drive? Or I suppose it's hard to tell because you've stopped the stimulants at the same time. Yeah. I've tried taking those like before I go out socializing and hitting on women and stuff and they seem to give me more energy. There's not like a clear night and day difference in sex drive, I have to say. Like I don't and I and I've experimented with like high, overloading on them, like taking several times the normal dose just to see what happens and you know, pretty good for energy level. I don't notice a clear like massive libido boost from them. No. See, like they cocaine they, would do the same job. Cocaine would, I think cocaine, yeah, kill Willie. Co co yeah cocaine uh, kills my, kills my boners. Mm. Yeah. Let's just say that I've done it. Um, you know, it good for sex drive, bad for boners. Let's say that. So yeah, don't recommend same, that. That's pretty bad. I suppose the same with, with alcohol. Like I, I guess there's not yeah. many um, recreational drugs that would improve sex drive. And we were talking with men and handsome ones a, a few yeah. months ago about um, GHB or, or, or yeah. GBL as they call it as well, which is kind of the bodybuilder's perfect alternative to alcohol. Um, yeah. That it improves sleep quality, GH, all this stuff. But unfortunately, because these date rapists are going around ruining it for everyone, it's become a classified yeah. drug. Um, well, you know, I wish they would just legalize GHB, but, you know, like maybe require it to be like heavily diluted and mixed with something that gives it a strong smell and flavor and color. Uh, because it's, the reason it's such a good date rape drug is because it's it's odorless, it's colorless, it's flavorless, and like the effective dose is so tiny, you're not going to notice it being added, you know. So if it was so legal in like a heavily, like heavily diluted form, bright blue you know, and like yeah. really strong, like I don't know, like, like flavor or like, something. Yeah, if it was like really bright blue, if it had like a strong like mint smell or something or raspberry or whatever strong flavor and it was diluted enough to where you had to drink like six ounces of it you know right then it was really, i think yeah uh, that is a fantastic idea yeah i can get behind yeah that. but yeah ghb is very i have not tried ghb actually but it is very good for your sex drive if you take a small amount but the other thing i do here is when it wears off you get a a dopamine rebound that'll cause severe anxiety is what what I hear from people, uh, depending on how vulnerable to that you are. So I don't know if it's the drug for me or if I the the anxiety or if the rebound would be too much for me. Maybe followed up with some weed as it's coming down. I don't know. I see, but then but, I suppose you get into the the game of having to sort of yeah. battle side see, effects with other drugs. You can see that you can see that moderation is a problem for me. <laughs> I'm the same. Yeah, I think this is yeah. uh, this is how we got into this into this mess. Um, cool. So we've, I mean, so far we've covered the general approach to self experimentation, how to track your variables, yeah, how to um, pick the things which have the highest yield and don't cause you to waste your time with them, inflammation and the specific protocol that you're using for that, and some mm. really actionable stuff for managing sex drive and yeah. libido. <clears throat> is there anything else in there that we've we've not covered? Uh, you know, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about today. I mean, you know, Fantastic. Uh, I, I'm sure I'll have more self experiments to talk about in a year, but that, uh, well, that's great. I'm glad you're always, you're always doing it. And like, so I, I'm guessing you document all of these on your website as well. I document a lot of them. Not all, I don't write about every single one of them on my website, but I've written about quite a few of them. I actually 
I have an old series of articles on some caffeine self experiments that I did a few years ago, and I actually use this brain scanning headset okay. to like to measure my brain waves on different dosages of caffeine. Plus, I would measure my performance, like my productivity in working, my performance at the gym, uh, my performance playing dodgeball. So that was really cool. You know that that headset's been discontinued, unfortunately. Uh, doesn't work anymore. No more support for it. So that was really cool while it lasted. And that, that self-experience probably a little out of date because I was very caffeine addicted. So if I was to redo it now, I think the ideal dosages for each of those things, productivity, sports, and gym, would probably be like half of what they were back then because I'm just so much more sensitive now. But but to, to summarize, what I found was low dose of caffeine is best for, for uh, productivity. A high dose of caffeine is best for gym performance, albeit just fucked my sleep, just fucked it. Like I don't actually recommend that because it's – the chronic effects do not justify the long – or the acute effects don't justify the chronic side effects. Cool. Um, and then the ideal dosage for playing sports because I played dodgeball at the time was somewhere in between. It was actually lower than the ideal gym dosage because A, too much caffeine would make me get tired too fast because I would waste energy and B – it really damaged my situational awareness. So if I had too much caffeine, I would I would just not see balls coming in from the side. I just get hit. Because you just like, like I suppose like if you're doing heavy squats, yeah. like you just need the raw aggression and the raw kind of focus. Yeah. But yeah, it it doesn't allow for the, the more kind of balanced yeah. um, thinking and approach. Yeah. Yeah. So actual sports require you to think straight to a greater degree than just weightlifting does. So a lower dosage of caffeine is better from that standpoint. So it doesn't just, just fuck your mind up. Makes sense. Well, yeah. Like, so if, if anyone wants to find out more about these or see the rest of your articles or find out more about you in general, where can they go? Johnfox.com. That's J O H N F A W K E S. Uh, as in Guy Fox, uh, for you, for you UK folks. I am actually related to Guy Fox. Fun fact. Oh really? Oh yeah, yeah. Uncle, my uncle did the whole ancestry research. I'm actually a distant relative. Oh man. So, yep. That is a strong claim to fame. Cool. Well, um, yeah, yeah, we'll put the yeah. link to that in the show notes and to the caffeine experimentation and the other article that you mentioned. Um, I'll go back and I can't remember what it was now. Uh, sorry, caffeine self experimentation, sex drive sex drive yeah we'll stick that yeah. in the uh, in the show you can't well. forget about that oh, you can't God. forget about no. that no. where am i at dick buckets come on <laughs> if there's one thing i want people to take away from this it's dick puppets the, fine we, we'll title it dick puppets <laughs> with john forks excellent john it's been a pleasure um we will stick all of the stuff in the show notes and I'll speak to you soon awesome thanks for having me yusuf bye-bye